स्टडी आई क्यू आई एस अब तैयारी हुई अफोर्डेबल हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स एंड वेलकम टू दिस डिस्कशन ऑफ वर्ल्ड हिस्ट्री इन टू डेज सेशन वी विल बी टेकिंग अप दॉपिक ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन सिंस दिस सीरीज इज फॉर दी एम आर पी स्टूडेंट्स हु आर अपियरिंग फॉर दी अपकमिंग मेन एग्जामिनेशन वी विल ट्राई टू कीप दिस डिस्कशन ब्रीफ कंसाइज एंड प्रिसाइज द पेस विल ऑल्सो बी ब्रिस्क since you have already prepared world history at least at a cursory level and therefore we will try to keep it very lean so that given the roi of world history we don't spend much time on this and are done with this quickly so let us start with the first topic without further ado which is industrial revolution what is meant by industrial revolution industrial revolution is the transformation of britain and then other nations from agrarian societies to industrial societies okay this transformation starts from somewhere around mid 18th century and then continues into the 19th century so the story of this transformation is basically industrial revolution now something that had started way back in mid 18th century this story has actually not yet stopped we have been seeing you know sequels of this series so to speak and right now we are going through industrial revolution 4.0 okay our syllabus limits us to industrial revolution 1 so to speak and this is the first phase of it industrial revolution basically was possible because of breakthrough in several production technologies now previously when mankind produced goods and services it was human and animal power that was harnessed to produce goods and services now naturally this had a lot of limitations and the technological breakthroughs that we saw in europe in the 17th 18th century that helped to transform this process from human or beast dominated to machine dominated okay what were the major breakthroughs that took place the first in that is the use of coal as fuel now coal was always known to mankind but its high calorie pick value could never be exploited on a great scale industrial revolution enabled that so coal's usage as fuel became a significant point in that second is the steam power using the heat of coal or its calorie pick value water was heated and steam was generated in the process and that steam was then used to run the machines the steam power so to speak this is the second major breakthrough third is the development in context of various transportation related technologies canals roads railways such other systems came into place which enabled easy cheap convenient and very comfortable forms of transport this transport was required for goods for raw material as well as for people from mid 18th century onwards we will see this transformation in britain to start with and then in other countries that will enable industrial revolution apart from this there were a lot of developments in context of agriculture in fact the preceding centuries had seen an agricultural revolution about which we will talk shortly this improvement in agriculture increased the production tremendously which was now responsible for supporting a much bigger population the bigger population gave not only labor but it also gave a big market to the goods of these industries so these technological breakthroughs together culminated in creating this revolution industrial revolution which has shaped the history of mankind ever since now let us see the two major phases as such of this revolution the first phase is that which happens in britain around middle of the 18th century we see these developments taking place in britain with the start of steam engine as improved by james watt now james watt in 1769 made a workable steam engine there was already an engine that was developed earlier but it was not a very efficient one james watt made significant improvement on it and that is how the steam engine became successful now using this technology britain embarked on its industrial revolution especially in the field of textiles slowly steadily this industrial revolution spread to neighboring countries of europe and then later on to usa japan and many other colonies also 
This is the first phase of industrial revolution. The second phase of industrial revolution is from 1870. In this second phase of industrial revolution, we are going to see more diversification in terms of the goods that are being produced. We are going to see more diversity in terms of the countries that are leading and we are going to see more breakthroughs in terms of technology that was used. So post 1870, this year 1870 is a very important threshold in the history of Europe. Post 1870, we see that industrial revolution also enters into a completely new phase. So what was new about this phase? We see new industries being dominant here. Earlier it was mostly textiles, now steel, chemical and a variety of other industries started to dominate in this revolution and it wasn't just about producing textile, that is one. Second is the use of fuel. Instead of coal, we now saw use of petroleum. Now coal definitely was very advantageous in that given context, but petroleum had much more calorific value. It had a much more ease when it came to transporting it. And therefore, in this second phase, we see a new type of fuel being used. Thirdly, electric generator and internal combustion engines. This is number three. These are the new types of engines that were being used to run the machines. Earlier, it was the steam engine. Now, since the fuel also has changed, the type of engine also changed and the efficiency of this engine was many times over. Consequently, the machines could produce lot more goods with much more efficiency given this change in technology. This is the third change. Fourth change is in terms of the countries who were at the forefront. While the first one was dominated by Britain, but Britain could not keep its monopoly on these technologies. Slowly, steadily, all other countries also started catching up and some started to even outperform Britain. Germany, for example, especially became very famous for chemical industry and steel. USA also started its own industrialization process post-independence and grew rapidly after 1865. So we will see USA will also become a leading industrial power by the time it is World War I. In Asia, we will also see the rise of Japan, which will become a imperial power, the only Asian imperial power at that point of time. So this is guys the second phase. I hope you understood the difference between the first phase and the second phase. First phase, Britain dominant, fuel is coal, industry is textile, that is the base. Second stage, we see that other countries, Germany and USA particularly will go ahead. The fuel that will be used will be petroleum. The type of engine that will be used will be different and the industries that it will specialize into will be much more diverse. So this second phase of industrial revolution starts from 1870 onwards. Okay. I hope you understood the core concept of industrial revolution. What is its meaning and what were its two important phases. Now let us see some key developments before industrial revolution. Now here is a bit of background regarding IR industrial revolution that we need to know briefly about. There may not be a direct question but then it's crucial to understand the, to have a robust foundation. First and foremost we see that in Europe there will be an age called as age of renaissance. This age of renaissance will bring Europe out of what was called as its dark age. During medieval times, Europe was in a deep slumber. It had forgotten its ancient glories of Roman and Greek civilizations. Religious worldview had become dominant and Europeans were only focused on God and the other world, that is world after death. And consequently from the 4th, 5th century onwards, Till say about 12th, 13th centuries, Europe goes into a slumber when it comes to human creativity. For a good 8 odd centuries, there was nothing significant happening in Europe. But because of multiple factors around 13th, 14th century, this starts to change. Europeans start to look back at their great illustrious past and start to take inspiration from it. They give up on the concepts of the dark middle ages. 
instead of prioritizing other worldly life they believe in making the most of this life that we have on earth this leads to an outburst of creativity this creativity starts to flow in the form of different arts different types of architecture science and technology so on and so forth europe comes out of the age of dogmas and superstitions and transforms itself into a society that was much more modern or on the route to becoming modern this is the first major background that we must know that is of renaissance second is the reformation as this transformation took place and europeans started to understand the kind of havoc the christian church had played with their uh, you know collective life there were demands for reforming the religion and therefore we see emergence of several movements such as the protestant movements okay there were many others the protestant were the most dominant what was the aim of these movements they wanted to purge the religion they were not irreligious they were not atheists they wanted to purge the religion of various corrupt practices that had come in during medieval times this period is called as reformation along with reformation we also see europe going through a scientific revolution based on these understandings europeans started to become more bold adventurous from age of dogmas age of reason starts age of reason europeans enter into a phase where they are not ready to accept anything on just face value they want evidence they want logic they want something convincing to accept anything this attitude of critical thinking independent thinking led to a lot of breakthroughs in the field of science and technology and therefore this age is called as scientific revolution you know the likes of newton galileo copernicus mendel mendel all those fellows who harassed you during your school days 6th 7th 8th standard okay all of them largely are from this period of scientific revolution okay why is that coming all of this is coming step by step guys okay so a new scientific method remember this phrase the scientific method what was the scientific method the scientific method was all about accepting things only on the basis of experiment on the basis of evidence on the basis of induction not accepting anything because religion says so or authorities says so nothing of that sort scientific method is a method that arrives at things based on logic and evidence this sort of an attitude the scientific method led to developments in many other areas the approach of scientists help to improve agricultural practices okay agriculture saw many tools implements technology know how knowledge of seasons etc increasing because of this scientific revolution for centuries human beings had practiced agriculture in the same manner like they used to during jesus christ's time but with scientific revolution there were thousands of innovation that came about a very quick example of that is the seed drill the seed drill what did the seed drill do the farmer used that simple device of a drill which was inserted or poked into the soil and the seed was sown deeper inside when the seed was sown deeper inside it got a better chance or strike ratio so to speak of developing into the crop suddenly because of this and many such other developments we see an agricultural revolution the food production in europe enhanced many times over since food production enhanced many time over it led to a substantial jump in population of europe particularly britain this will be very significant that because industry requires labor and industry requires market all of that is going to come from this agricultural revolution and its consequent support of more people okay then around 1453 another major development takes place the year is 1453 what happens in 1453 In 1453 the capital of Eastern Roman Empire falls to Ottoman Turks and with the fall of this capital 
ट्रेड गोइंग टूवर्ड्स ईस्ट ओवरलैंड रूट गोइंग टूवर्ड्स ईस्ट चाइना एंड इंडिया इन पर्टिकुलर एंड एशिया इन जनरल बिकेम रिस्की एंड एक्सपेंसिव नाउ दिस लेड मेनी यूरोपियंस टू थिंक फॉर ऑल्टरनेट सेफ सी रूट टू एशिया इन जनरल एंड इंडिया इन पर्टिकुलर now using the advancement of scientific knowledge better knowledge about seasons better knowledge about making ships the knowledge about the world being a round ball like shape many europeans set out to find that sea route while they could not find india right away they ended up making many geographical discoveries in distant lands in the new world like north america south america in africa also and all of these new discoveries created colonies in distant areas colonies for europeans this is where wherever exploration explorers went european people of that explorers country followed him and there the government used to set up colonies of people so that the natural resources of those areas could be exploited these colonies then help to develop a long distance trade long distance trade between whom between the mother country and this distant colony this long distance trade led to evolution of idea of mercantilism <clears throat> this is an important concept guys mercantilism what is mercantilism about mercantilism is about every state trying to promote its trade to have a very strong balance of trade positive and strong balance of trade every state felt that they must export the maximum and import the minimum so that they will have a positive balance of trade this was derived from the idea of finite economy what is meant by this idea of finite economy <clears throat> this time in europe the dominant idea of economy was that economy is limited okay total economy of the world is finite and this wealth of the world is redistributed based on trade so that country which exports more and imports less is effectively increasing its wealth so mercantilism became a matter of state policy state encouraged trade so that through positive balance of trade they could become richer and richer this was the idea of mercantilism i hope you got the concept guys what is meant by mercantilism this mercantilism will derive drive the relationships with the colonies next comes the concept of enlightenment what is enlightenment in the 16th 17th and 18th centuries various thinkers took inspiration from this scientific revolution just as scientists like for example newton gave laws of gravity so these thinkers theorists felt that if scientists have given such universal laws there can be universal laws to be discovered for polity society so on and so forth also so these thinkers started to give new laws concepts and ideas that would be universally accessible that would be universally applicable okay and this led to a period in history where new political thoughts emerged people like locke voltaire rousseau uh, descartes many of these thinkers they are basically part of this phase of history called as enlightenment where they are trying to give universal laws and principles for mankind inspired from the scientific revolution so if science can give universal laws so can we is the driving force over there this led to breakthrough of new ideas ideas like republicanism ideas like liberty ideas like secularism equality justice humanism so on and so forth okay i hope you got the concepts up to this point then together we have to see these two concepts enclosure movement in britain the land that the landlords owned were open for the peasants to cultivate they could use the land to till grow crop and share a certain proportion with the landlord and keep the rest for their subsistence but the landlords 
in the 14th 15th century onwards realized that it was more profitable to rear sheep for wool instead of giving it to peasants and therefore these landlords did not allow peasants to till on their land and instead erected compounds which were called as enclosures as you can understand from the word it encloses a piece of land and in this enclosed land they started to rear sheep now because of this movement which was supported by british laws the peasants became unemployed they did not have access to land to cultivate and therefore these jobless peasants now started to look for opportunities in big cities and towns thus started a migration from rural areas to urban areas in the seek of in the search for jobs these migrants will become the labor fuel for the new factories during industrial revolution i hope you got this idea guys okay. lastly the ideas of adam smith adam smith corrected this idea of finite economy in his wealth of nations he criticized this idea as being wrong and false towards the end of 18th century or in the last quarter rather adam smith wrote his book and said that these ideas are wrong instead we must rather foster competition and through that competition the market will automatically serve the interest of the society and therefore europeans slowly start to transform and there the idea of capitalism will start so this guys is the basic primer or background regarding this topic of industrial revolution i hope you got the point guys okay now one quick idea that i want to share over here these merchants who were earning profit through their trade over the course of decades and last few centuries they had amassed a lot of capital which they wanted to now invest and that field of investment that emerged was in industries earlier their capital was invested in trade but then trade was much more riskier and gave much lesser profits and a smart capitalist always is on the lookout for a better economic opportunity got this idea and therefore these capitalists they started to invest their money where now into industry and this process will start first in england now this begs the question guys that why does it start first in england and not anywhere else so we will quickly see all the factors that enabled england to be the first country of industrial revolution first is its island nature since britain was an island it was away from rest of europe so you have europe elsewhere and because it was away from europe it was not involved in the convulsions that were taking place in europe europe was constantly at war 100 years war was there 30 years war takes place in the 17th century france and germany cannot see eye to eye austria and russia have issues so these were constantly going on britain being an island country was away from all of this and therefore it was much more politically economically stable and therefore the merchants could invest their money over here this is reason number 1 reason number 2 this seclusion helped britain or england to advance towards democracy since there was stability there was peace there was lack of you know invasions from foreign countries therefore people unlocked the next demand you know you might have surely heard about maslow's need hierarchy theory maslow has graded human needs and he says that once the lower level need is fulfilled then you advance to the next level so same was the case for british people here their basic need of stability peace security was fulfilled thanks to geography and therefore the next level need evolved that is share in power why should the king have all the fun there used to be an old old advertisement of scooty pep 
ठीक है इट हैड अ टैगलाइन व्हाई शुड बॉयज हैव ऑल द फन सो द ब्रिटिश पीपल सेड व्हाई शुड किंग हैव ऑल द फन वी शुड ऑल बिकम किंग्स द पावर दैट इज कंसंट्रेशन कंसंट्रेटेड इन द क्राउन ऑफ द किंग लेट अस डिस्ट्रीब्यूट दैट इक्वली अमंगस्ट ऑल मेंबर्स and that is the process evolution of the idea of democracy basically so democracy comes to england and that will be a great boost for industrial revolution later third is natural harbors you can see in the map over here the coastline of britain is very crooked this sort of a crooked or what is called as indented coastline this indented coastline creates natural harbors in places like this in places like this these natural harbors became a big asset for britain as it developed a culture of maritime activities you see wherever in history you find natural harbors you will see that the people over there were always seafaring take the long coastline of india and see the places where there were harbors there you will see a history of seafaring people britain was no different because of this geographical factor so maritime activities were intense next britain was also gifted in terms of water water was required in industrial revolution on a great scale because it was water being converted to steam that was going to run the engines then coal and iron ore reserve coal is the fuel and iron is the raw material for many processes you can see here in the map the red colored areas are coal deposits and the yellow colored ones are deposits of iron ore these two primary minerals abound in britain and that was a great advantage similarly criss crossing of tributaries many rivers criss crossed each other and that enabled development of canals and canal bridges based transport so these were the geographical factors guys that helped britain now let's see the political factors the first political factor is obviously the stability that came because of its seclusion because of its geography because of that geography we saw development of democracy and this democracy enabled the capitalists to have a share in power share in power as democracy matured more and more people got the right to contest elections for parliament to vote for it and initially the people who got the share were the rich merchants and industrialists naturally these people used the democratic avenues of parliament to further their own interests so we see that the state slowly became a pro capitalist state several laws were passed which favored the capitalists the ruling class of britain was also supportive of capitalism the ruling elites were visionary if you see east india company just to give an example a majority of the shareholding of east india company came from the ruling elites even the royal family had invested in this joint stock company this shows their vision their idea of making more money from their capital this naturally aided britain the ruling classes support towards capitalism thus we see many laws were passed which promoted industrial revolution directly or indirectly for example enclosure laws allowed landlords to put up enclosures and disallow peasants from cultivating their soil now these peasants were forced then to go to cities therefore industry got labor similarly navigation laws were passed navigation laws made it compulsory on colonies to use british shipping only this compulsion of using british ship shipping gave a big boost to british shipping industry which was very essential for success of industrial revolution in britain without good shipping britain could not expect to be a buyer and seller of goods over long distance and therefore that shipping industry was crucial and politics of britain basically enabled that so these are basically guys the po political reasons now let us see some economic reasons economic reason first is expanding economy of britain over the course of 16th and 17th century we see 
that the economy of Britain is slowly expanding. As it you know, comes out of that late medieval phase and enters towards early modern phase, we will see that the British economy's scale will grow. Its production of goods and services, its trade with other economies will increase. Enclosure movement is another major economic cause. Yes, there will be some overlap here, guys. We are helpless in that regard because points are interrelated. Enclosure movement will enable more availability of labor. Agricultural revolution led to more production and more production led to more population and more population meant more labor and bigger market. So all of this was a virtuous cycle. Then very significantly availability of capital. This economic expansion, trade and commerce that Britain was doing for the previous two centuries had resulted in accumulation of capital in Britain. That capital wanted a field of investment and industrial revolution proved to be the best one. Development of modern banking system in England. You see Bank of England is the oldest bank which we can call a you know, modern sort of a bank. This was first developed where? In England. Bank of England and then many others. By the time it is mid 19th century, Britain had close to 600 banks at that point of time. So a very robust banking system was available. Why is this necessary? Banks allow credit, raising of loans. They allow systems of payment. They facilitate insurance also. So many financial services that industry required were coming from these banks. Then emergence of major cities. Cities like Manchester, cities like Liverpool. These are all cities that owe their origin to development of industries. These cities had just come up and industrial revolution gave a big fillip to them. New forms of transport. The Mac Adamized Road. What in India we call as Pakka Road. You know that Dambar Tarwala Road. That macadamized road also is a outcome of industrial revolution. Then introduction of railways. Railways were introduced from 1814 onwards. Railway locomotives. Basically for transporting raw material and coal. Especially more so coal because it was heavy, it was bulky, it was difficult to carry. So this allowed transporting of coal and iron ore over a long distance. And because of this, factories could now be set up in distant cities. Earlier factories had to be set up near mines to reduce the transport cost. But then that was a big challenge because mine areas did not have other facilities. With introduction of railways, now it was easily possible to carry this raw material over a long distance. So that is one railway introduction. 1833, these railways were now used for transporting people also. Then modern postal systems, modern postage, using of stamps for paying for the service of post, allowing uniform rate, irrespective of where you sent, you get uniform rate in payment. So these kind of ideas developed in Britain and these are you know, important, uh, these economic reasons. Lastly, technical training. Industrial revolution required some skill sets, people who were skilled. They needed plumbers, they needed fitters, they needed welders, they needed fabricators. So all of these trades were taught in England in specialized institutes. This made skilled manpower available for this revolution. So we have seen geographical, political and economic factors. Quickly a few social factors. Number one, practical bent of mind of British people. Unlike other Europeans who were more keen to know about secrets of science, the British people had an applied bent of mind. They always were on the lookout of improving technology, improving systems and processes. And therefore we see they, the British people, they are not well known for new scientific discoveries, but they are very well known for newer technological innovations. That was the nature that the society had. Secondly, entrepreneurial nature. 
businessman like nature risk taking nature some communities some regions nations have this attitude like in india you will see a lot of business communities who traditionally always do business they don't do jobs so that entrepreneurial nature or risk taking attitude was significant then liberal and experimented experimenting society 19th century britain is the mecca of liberal liberalism what is liberalism liberalism is absence of restraints on an individual's rights 19th century britain will see more and more rights being extended to people they will be more and more experimenting with newer and newer ideas this created a congenial environment for industry and innovation see if a society is closed if it is regressive then that society is not able to progress but if a society is liberal and experimenting it will be a ground for germination of new ideas new methods new technologies take usa today usa is a similar country over the last several uh, you know decades and consequently it has been able to progress then free from church shackle the british church the anglican church had long ago cut off its ties with the roman catholic church although both were christians but they did not have formal ties anymore the church was kept limited to religion related aspects only it did not have the power to interfere in secular mundane matters all of this enabled the british society to flourish and prosper i hope you guys got the idea regarding why it took place in britain now briefly we'll just note the importance of textile industry in industrial revolution so this is the first industry where industrial revolution actually starts from 18th century onwards before this revolution started britain used to traditionally import cotton from india but with some breakthroughs in technology for manufacturing textile britain developed a much more efficient way of producing textile in its own country and thus reducing the dependence on india rather finishing it off completely what were some of these technologies john k invented the flying shuttle which helped to weave yarn into cloth subsequent to that hargreaves he invented the spinning jenny which meant which made spinning very fast eight times over spinning could be made faster then came arkwright's water frame that allowed water power for spinning purpose so automatically now spinning became even more fast samuel crompton created what is called as the mule which combined the spinning jenny as well as water frame these two combined together further enhance the production of you know uh, cotton textiles lastly cartwright started power looms that were based on water and steam so this again enhanced the production of textile many times over now textile industry saw these breakthroughs and consequently textile industry was the first one to get industrialized and see the process is happening reverse first weaving related technology comes then spinning related technology comes and then after that will come ginning related technology okay ginning is about removing the seed from the cotton spinning is about creating yarn and weaving is converting the yarn to fabric that is the last stage but the first technology came in weaving now when weaving technology came and weaving became very fast but yarn was not available at that same rate so yarn related technology comes when that technology becomes very fast cotton was not available on sufficient scale because of presence of seed in the cotton so that technology of ginning comes about in this manner in a reverse way the technological developments took place and gave textile industry the honor of being the first industry of industrial revolution now very briefly we are going to see how this revolution spread to different parts of the world okay we'll take up individually some of these countries okay all of these things are there in the notes but some important case studies we will quickly discuss let us take them one by one the biggest case study of course is that of usa usa is like england on steroids okay 
वट एवर इंग्लैंड हैड इन टर्म्स ऑफ एडवांटेजेस दैट वी डिस्कस्ड अर्लियर इट्स जोग्राफिकल पोलिटिकल इकोनॉमिक एक्सेट्रा फीचर्स ऑल ऑफ दो ऑन अ मच बिगर स्केल दैट इज यूएसए Now, after becoming independent, America becomes independent. 1776 Declaration of Independence, and then 1783 Treaty of Paris, America got independence from Britain. King George said, "Ja, Timran, jile apni zindagi." You are independent from now. Okay, this is what leads America to rapidly industrialize itself. In fact, one major grudge that USA had. with respect to british rule was that it did not did not allow americans to industrialize themselves britain wanted usa to remain a raw material provider and market for finished goods therefore it did not allow industry to develop there so americans wanted industrialization okay. after independence northern region of america the northern states they started to industrialize rapidly whereas southern states were more dependent on agriculture and this worked very well for usa the agriculture of the south provided raw material and industrial base was given by the north and this was fantastic for usa usa developed what is called as the waltham system where all the activities that we just discussed in manufacturing textile you know that ginning spinning and weaving all such activities could be done simultaneously on the same machine and therefore efficiency increased tremendously so usa also contributed in advancement of technology in industrial revolution napoleonic wars provided usa with a great opportunity to export napoleon implemented a system called as the continental system under the system napoleon prevented imports from britain into europe so britain's imports will not be allowed and britain was industrializing it was producing goods on a mass scale and looking for market and napoleon comes along and says no you your products will not be allowed in europe henceforth so naturally there was a big void and there was a big opportunity for others to explore and america latched on to it britain's malady became america's opportunity and american started to export in a big way to europe elias ho in 1846 developed the sewing machine the sewing machine that we use the concept came from elias ho and this enabled stitching on a much bigger scale than earlier stitching was now a lot more easy so now producing shirts and all of that became very easy because of this sewing machine in 1861 to 65 period we'll discuss this later the civil war of usa takes place in the civil war the northern and southern states fought over the issue of slavery and this civil war was the biggest challenge that usa had faced till that point of time fortunately usa survived and after this trial it emerged even stronger post civil war we see a very rapid industrialization of usa many laws were passed this typically every government will do to promote industries roads railways canals were developed railways connecting across usa the entire you know length and breadth of that country from east coast atlantic ocean to west coast pacific ocean the railways connected them there were canals there were roads that were laid out and this was the period of building up of usa post the civil war many institutions like business corporations stock exchanges were set up to facilitate industrial development we hear about big industrialists like andrew carnegie or rockefeller okay both of them very famous for their foundations today andrew carnegie foundation and rockefeller foundation on a side note rockefeller foundation help india with its green revolution related experiments it was one foundation which had helped india okay many new inventions also take place graham bell telephone 
Thomas Edison, electricity, okay, all of these things will come about during this phase. So USA will rapidly industrialize. So this is about spread to USA. Then later, other European countries will also follow Britain. After the end of Napoleonic Wars, 1850-15, till then Europe was convulsed in warfare. After this, many countries start to copy British model. Coal was discovered in Belgium. Now, back then, Belgium meant Belgium plus Netherlands, Luxembourg, all of that area together. Okay. State supported it in big way like British government had. Okay. British migrants coming to Belgium secretly brought technologies that British were using. And slowly, steadily, industrial revolution started to spread in Belgium. Belgium was very significant because of its location as a gateway to Europe's trade. After Belgium, next major country is Germany. Traditionally, there were 300 German states. These 300 German states were combined into 39 by Napoleon. And out of these 39, Prussia became the main leader. Prussia. Under Prussian leadership, we see that these 39 German states started to cooperate with each other and foster economic development. Railways were laid out. Railway will be a common feature across all country. A common customs union called as Zollverein was created. It was a common union for trade related purpose. Uniform systems of weight and measures and many other steps were taken which enabled these 39 German states to become one single fiscal unit. And slowly, steadily, it started to develop over other European countries. Alsace and Lorraine were later snatched away from France, 1870. And this Alsace and Lorraine gave Germany access to iron and coal, which was so crucial for industrial revolution. 1870, Germany, after getting united, focused all its energy on rapid industrialization and within no time, by the time it is 20th century, Germany is a leading industrial power which is rivaling Britain. In many areas such as chemicals, agriculture, science, uh, steel industry, in such areas Germany had actually overtaken Britain. And this is what made Lord Saab Britain insecure. Because it saw Germany is about to steal its number one position in this very crucial technology. And therefore, this will become a major cause for World War I in the background. Okay, a significant factor. So this is about Germany, guys. Then France. France constantly was going through political upheavals during Napoleon's times and subsequently also. But nevertheless, the competition of Britain made these powers the French rulers realized the importance of industrial revolution. Therefore, we see Napoleon took some efforts. He again, the same things will be done. Infrastructure will be laid out, railways will be created, laws will be passed, uh, banking system will be developed, shipping industry will be given a boost. All countries will try to do the same formula that Britain had done. Napoleon tried and then subsequent rulers, Louis Philippe and Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, he also tried to make France a more industrialized country while it could not match Britain or Germany. But definitely by the time it is World War I, France is also a significant industrialized nation. Okay. Then last significant country from Europe is Russia. Russia politically speaking was very important in Europe. But economically speaking, Russia was like a poor cousin of these European powers. It was tremendously backward. And this backwardness of Russia was for two reasons. One was its geographical climatic factors, the extreme cold nature of its country. And second was the kind of society it had. The Russians were a heavily feudal society and even had the practice of serfdom continued right up to mid 19th century. Because of these factors, Russia remained industrially much more weak than other European powers. 
Nevertheless, the Russian rulers realized the importance of quickly industrializing and we see some steps and measures being taken. What was done? Again, same thing, railways, infrastructure, exploiting natural resources, financial institutions being built, so on and so forth. 1861, the serfdom practice was also abolished in Russia. Okay. Foreign investors were invited, banking institutions were created and all of these things were being done. From 1819 to 1914, this phase, quite late vis-a-vis -vis other European powers, Russia tried to ramp up its industry. And to some extent, it was successful also from 1819 to 1914. Nevertheless, it was nowhere a match to major industrial powers like Germany and Britain. And therefore, when they will meet in the First World War, Russians will be beaten very badly. And before that, they were even beaten by Japan, a rising Asian power. All of this failure of Russia led to the Russian Revolution of 1917. The communists came to power and later Stalin took over control in the 1920s and paid tremendous attention to industrialization of Russia. In the 1920s and 30s, during the first two fire plans especially, the Russian economy will very handsomely expand and it will be a major industrial power by the time the World War II knocks on European doors. This is Russia for you guys. Okay. Lastly, Japan, an Asian power. Japan was a xenophobic, feudal, inward looking society. Next door neighbor China was also fairly similar. In the 19th century, the Chinese were suffering humiliation at the hands of European powers. The Japanese were seeing this and they realized that if they did not change their ways, then after China, up in ka number aane wala tha. Already Europeans, especially, you know, Americans particularly, they were knocking on their doors. And therefore, the Japanese realized that they have to quickly transform themselves, adapt to the new situation or else they will also face the same exploitation like China. So, you know, in 1870, as one of the greatest example of commitment to the nation, the Japanese went through a process that is called as Meiji Restoration. The feudal Shogun system, Shogun was like the Peshwa, just to make you understand, huh? was like the Peshwa to the Japanese emperor. All power was concentrated in the hands of the Shogun. Okay, and this Shogunate system kept Japan in a medieval feudalistic kind of a society. Below the Shogun were several Samurais. They were all feudal lords who had lands and provided fighting services for the Emperor. Okay, for the noble above him and then above him ultimately to Emperor. This system was ended in one stroke through Meiji restoration. And Japan started its process of industrialization. What did Japan do? Again, the same concepts. Infrastructure, railway, banking, passing of laws. Additionally, Japan invited foreign experts to their country, brought foreign investment, trained its youth. Many thousands of Japanese students were sent to foreign countries to learn latest technology, skills from there and come back and industrialize their motherland. And through this process, in a very short span of time, Japan was able to industrialize itself so much so that within three to four years itself, they were running their first train within three to four years, years itself. Okay. In 1904, the Japanese were able to defeat the Russians. They defeated the Russians and this demonstrated the strength of Japan as an industrial country. It was able to defeat a major white European power. This is how Japan will transform guys. Okay. Chale, now let us see impact of industrial revolution on colon colonialism or colonization. Industrial revolution gave a big boost to colonialism. We'll go very quick. Industrial revolution required raw material. It required market. 
and all of this was going to come from where it was going to come from obviously distant colonies so industrial revolution necessitated creation and maintenance and control over colonies industrial revolution gave european powers the power to control colonies better ships better weapons better communication technology all of this was possible because of industrial revolution okay and all these technologies enabled europeans to maintain their control over the colonies so industrial revolution did both the things it created the need for colonialism and it created the capacity for it the need as well as the capacity 84% of world surface area by the end of 19th century was under european powers colonialism started to be associated with not just industrial revolution and economic wealth but also with national prestige the political idea of nationalism became the dominant narrative of the world and each country vied for more and more national prestige based on the size and scale of colonies so industrial revolution plus nationalism they get fused together and ultimately having more and more colonies became the yardstick to measure the greatness of a country these countries started to become exceedingly suspicious about others regarding their colonial possessions you take the example of britain british people were very very concerned about their possessions in india they were always fearful and therefore to protect their possessions these europeans entered into secret military alliances one against another one against another my enemy's enemy is my friend on those lines and ultimately this divided europe and made it into a tinder box each country was trying to build up more and more arms to fight the other in case of an eventual war which ultimately resulted into world war 1 so ultimately world war 1 can also be traced back to industrial revolution guys had it not been for that desire of industrial revolution world war 1 perhaps would have not happened of course there are no ifs and buts in history but we just need to know the threads lastly we'll see the consequences of industrial revolution and then conclude what were the economic consequences again certain points will overlap with our discussions that we have done and hence we'll see them very quickly england and other countries became rich we understand that it gave a boost to imperialism we already saw that new jobs were created okay you had laborers you had supervisors you had managers okay you had trainers then apart from this it created demand for banking industry insurance industry lawyers all of these were new jobs that were being created banks and financial institutions got a big boost banking sector developed concentration of wealth a few european countries barely 6 to 7 countries they were able to dominate the rest of the world and therefore there was concentration of wealth in these few countries and within these countries concentration of wealth was in the hands of capitalists the common worker common laborers they lived a very bare minimal kind of an existence the capitalists the investors they were doing very well agriculture developed urbanization was fostered you all can relate with this a political consequences number 1 capitalist lobby was created the term lobby what is meant by lobby guys lobby means a pressure group capitalists rich in money having a lot of stake and interest in business they all come together and create a pressure group on the government that is called as a capitalist lobby laws were slowly influenced by capitalist using their new found wealth they started to influence government's policies government's laws they entered parliament contested elections helped their people win election and through them got laws in their favor passed industrialists started to enter parliament the reform act of 1832 was passed britain in 19th century we'll see a movement that is called as chartist movement okay 
there will be further deepening or penetration of democracy and all of this will start because the british capitalist interest wanted pen penetration of democracy they wanted more and more people from amongst them to have a right to access to vote and contest in elections so that will start the process and later other sections will also start demanding this will lead to furthering of democracy and the most classic example of that is the reform act of 1832 then tensions with other countries each country wanted to have maximum share in trade at the cost of another country and therefore they always ran into each other like see what happened in india the british and the french they fought three wars the british and the dutch they fought british and portuguese also initial times they have also fought so they did not want to share with each other also this led to conflicts and one form of that conflict was protectionism concept what is meant by protectionism each country raised its tariff walls tariff barriers so that the goods of other countries that are coming in my country they become expensive and my own products remain cheap so that they will survive in the competition each country started to do this this led to active rivalry led to arms race and ultimately to world war one we have seen these ideas so there was economic and then political consequences now lastly socio-cultural consequences and we'll close this topic industrial revolution divided the society into two major classes first capitalist second labor capitalist class and labor class Earlier, there were different identities. Somebody was Christian, somebody was Jew. Somebody was Protestant, somebody was Catholic. A labor was English or he may be Welsh or he may be Scot. There were different identities. But after industrial revolution, there was only one dichotomy, which is either you were in this class or you were in this class, primarily speaking. Okay. This led to increased class consciousness that, okay, I am a worker. And because I am a worker, there is exploitation against me. Okay. This leads to class consciousness. This class consciousness leads to people uniting and fighting for their rights in the form of trade unions. That is trade unionism, guys. Okay. So, emergence of class, class consciousness, trade unionism. When this did not give results, new ideologies were born. Ideologies of socialism and communism were a result of this. This ideological difference finally led to conflicts. Capitalism versus communism, worker versus industrialist, all of this led to conflicts. Conflicts between whom? Different sections, different viewpoints. Okay. So 19th century, 20th century first part, there will be a lot of conflict in Europe. While all of this is happening, the industrialist is exploiting the life of the worker to the fullest possible extent. The life of the worker is a wretched one. Not only male workers but also women and children were employed on big scale and even they were not spared from this exploitation. The common you know, working hours used to be 17 to 18 hours and 7 days a week. On top of this, they were beaten up abused so that they work because of fear even children as young as eight and nine years old were working in these kind of conditions children were in fact preferred children and women children because because of the small bodies and small fingers they could go inside machines maintain them okay and then they could it was easy to threaten them to make them scared and get work out of them Disease, malnutrition and crime, these were common in areas that the workers lived. Generally, they lived in slum areas. Conditions were completely unregulated. The state had nothing to do with all of this. The state had conveniently relegated all of this to the understanding between the industrialist and the worker. If the worker does not like, he can leave. He's not a slave. He's a free man. But then there is something called as economic compulsion. The state was not ready to admit that. Okay? So state is not regulating. 
Finally, family as an institution started to break down because of this. The worker and his family did not have the time to spend together. No bonding develops because of that. And slowly, steadily, that unit starts to break down. Immorality, different types of addictions, all of these start to make inroads into the, into the then society. This is the kind of society that we see in industrial revolution. Okay. So we've tried to keep it crisp guys, crisp and focused only on the major keywords so that in less amount of time we can cover more topics. This was our first session. In my next session, I will talk about American Revolution. I'll see you in my next class. Study IQ IS. Ab tayari hui affordable.